This is our lecture series we call Tuesdays With. It's based, that title is based on the 1997 bestseller uh, by Mitch Album called Tuesdays With Maury. And the reason we chose that connection was because that book is a wonderful story about a university student who continued his relationship with a professor far beyond his university years. And that is to say, learning goes on well beyond the age of 21. And our series is intended to do that this year as well as next year, which we'll talk about uh, at the end of our presentation today. Tuesdays with, and today, Don Quattlebaum. So you get the title of a book today. Tuesdays with Don, that's a little longer than Tuesdays with Maury, but so glad to have Don with us today. Um, our presentation is with Don. He's the president of White House Farms, producer of Andy's Charleston Gold Rice, as well as a number of others you see there is used at some of the best, all the best restaurants, we'll say, uh, throughout the Low Country and the Willie household. Our home has that as well. Um, and also he is the president, and this is very significant, of the Andy Quattlebaum and Blackwell Family Foundation, a foundation committed to honoring the legacy of compassion, care, and positive energy that Andy Quattlebaum, Don's son, showed family, friends, and organizations to which he was so dearly dedicated. The foundation is focused on supporting a variety of initiatives important to Andy throughout his brief life. Education, conservation, community enrichment, veterans, animals, and veterinary schools. We're so glad to see all of you here today, and we're very glad to have Don Quattlebaum come to speak to us on Growing Rice in Georgetown County in 2024. Welcome. Thanks. Oops. All right, something. Here, I'll sit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, there have been a lot of things that I've been, after I speak, that it's been done and through and everybody closes down, but this one's planned. So this is the last one for this year. Um, and if you were at the talk I gave at the Rice Museum, you might as well leave because it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> um, maybe next year I'll change it. You know, I, I love history, but I'm not a historian, and I was not raised to be a farmer. And most of this stuff that I'm going to tell you was gotten off of the Internet, which is kind of dubious, so take it with a grain of salt. But I did use some volumes extensively for my research. Um, for about history of rice in South Carolina, The Seed from Madagascar by Duncan Clinch Hayward, Low Country Time and Tide by James Tooten, and Shadow of a Dream by Peter Conclanus. And I certainly have not given notes or anything by this. This would not pass a prior review. But for my personal knowledge of growing rice, I want to thank Campbell Cox from Carolina Plantation Rice. Um, Glenn Roberts from Anson Mills, Greg Johnsman from uh, Marsh Hen Mill, David Shields and the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation, and Dr. Anna McClung, who is a rice scientist at Dale Bumpers Rice Institute in Stuttgart. In learning along with me and surpassing me in many respects have been Nelson Small and Griffith James at White House and we couldn't get it, any of it done without our main man, Cody Strickland, who does everything from planning to processing. Um, and we have the lovely Taylor here helping taste some rice today, and we're going to sell some too, if anybody will buy it. Um, <clears throat> our son Paul has been diligent trying to help us grow, along with his wife Liz, and we're trying to establish a, a bigger market. And I'm sorry, that sun's right in your face there. Okay. And I do all this in loving memory of my wife Hayden and my son Andy, who love this land. They are missed every day. <clears throat> Rice is the most important food crop in the world. Um, over 20% of all the caloric intake in the world is from rice. And it's a staple crop for more than half of the world's population. In 2020, there were 750 million pounds of rice produced. Only one million tons, only one million tons produced in the U.S. 
major producers are the usual suspects is India, China, Japan, Korea, Philippines, Indonesia. Asian rice was first domesticated between eight and 13,000 years ago in China. African rice was independently domesticated about 3,000 years ago. Somewhere around the 10th century, Muslim traders introduced Asian rice to Africa, and it was found to mill easier, grow better, had better yields, and soon it became the dominant rice in Africa as well. So African rice is now limited basically to people growing locally. <clears throat> Asian rice has pretty much taken over everything. Asian rice spread to Asia, Japan, Korea, and India between 3500 B.C. and 2000 B.C., thence to the Philippines, Borneo, and the Malay Peninsula. About the first century A.D., it had waited, made its way to Madagascar and the coast of East Africa. Many of the foods enjoyed in North America were brought from Africa during the slave trade, including rice. Many Africans were taken from the rice producing regions due to their knowledge of how to cultivate rice. In Europe, rice was known in the classical world, being imported from Egypt and perhaps West Asia. Alexander the Great's soldiers brought rice to Greece from their exploits, and the Moors brought Asiatic rice to the Iberian Peninsula in the 10th century. They also brought it to Sicily, where it spread throughout Italy. By the 15th century, white rice was throughout Europe. There are over 40,000 varieties of rice, perhaps as many as 100,000. They come from two families. Um, subspecies of Asian rice are Japonica and Indica. Japonica rice is like sushi rice, it's short and fat and sticky. Indica rice is what we normally know all the Carolina gold, Charleston gold, Santee gold, basmati, jasmine are all indica rices. So in South Carolina, tradition holds that in 1694, a ship from Madagascar had to put into Charleston for repairs, and a bushel of rice was given to Dr. Henry Woodward, who planted Carolina gold for the first time. This story is probably not true, but that's our story and we're going to stick to it. Um, however, by the early 1700s, Carolina gold was, was well known, although it was known simply as Carolina rice. And even today, you can go in a grocery store and you can buy Carolina rice and it's nothing but commodity rice grown anywhere. Um, you know, it's kind of like Kleenex or something we didn't trademark it properly. <clears throat> so modernization in Europe enabled the growth of the colonies. Once economic growth was achieved past simple substance, people were more affluent. They were able to use, use imports from the colonies. Um, <clears throat> so the stage was set. Agricultural productivity was increasing, the industrialization of all sectors, and increased standards of living. So once it was shown that rice, rice could grow and thrive in the coastal regions of South Carolina, the need for labor and knowledge was apparent. In West Africa, the domestication of rice had involved clearing swamps and making canals for irrigation, truly backbreaking work. The same jobs would be needed to transform the swaps, swamps of the low country. This caused the horrific slave trade from West Africa to flourish. These slaves provided not only labor, but knowledge about growing rice that the Europeans lacked. To say life was difficult in South Carolina is an extreme understatement. The whites brought many diseases, such as smallpox, that the Native Americans had no uh, immunity to, and it was very dangerous for them, wiped out many of them. In addition, the tropical and temperate diseases such as malaria, yellow fever, dysentery, 
typhus, typhoid fever were deadly for the whites, and the black slaves were also frightfully susceptible to some of these diseases that were not prevalent in their native West Africa. Mortality rates among the African-born would remain considerably higher than those slaves born, born on American shores. The death rate for whites in Christ Church Parish in Charleston was incredible. In the 1760s, 86 out of 100 born died before the age of 20, and only 3% lived to the age of 50. The statistics for the slaves is unavailable, but you can imagine that it must have been worse due to the horrific conditions of their life. The period from about 1720 to the American Revolution was a time of great prosperity for the whites in South Carolina. Rice fields were being reclaimed from the rivers and indigo was being grown on the high grounds. Indigo was being used to make dye for the Royal Navy and of course after the revolution that died out. But rice continued to grow. This growth was largely in South Carolina as Georgia rice growers had remained mainly loyal to the crown and their lands were confiscated. Rice exports peaked in 1860 at about 100 million pounds, over half of which was grown in Georgetown County. Civil War brought emancipation, destruction, and financial collapse. After the war, the rice industry recovered, but never again reached the peaks of pre-war era. Post-war production peaked in about the 1880s and slowly declined from there, and almost all vestiges were gone by 1920. Rice culture, on the other hand, still today maintains its spot on the tables in the low country. I'm sure many of you, like myself, grew up eating rice every day. And it wasn't until I went to Clemson and they started serving these potato things. And I said, what is this? <laughs> well, where's the rice? But it's very important still today. But what happened to the rice culture? Was it solely the Civil War? Certainly that was a large part, but that was not the only reason. Rice is grown in tidal swamps. Um, these swamps have great benefits. The soils, you can get that if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 these muddy soils, always being underwater, don't allow for full decomposition, so there's a lot of peat in this soil. And every gardener knows peat is great for growing things, but if you dig up peat, then you're releasing greenhouse gases, and that's kind of frowned on nowadays. But if it's in the ground naturally and you're not digging it out, you don't have to worry about that. So you get all the benefits without the problems. <clears throat> Another benefit of, the, of using these swampy fields adjacent to the river is using the river for the irrigation. We're still, and I meant to bring a trunk sample, but we're still using trunks, which is a wooden box underneath the dike and you open one gate, and as the tide rises, the water flows through into the field, and when the tide falls, that gate slams shut. So, and you just reverse it to take water out. So we're able to use the river water for irrigation. In Arkansas, California especially, those two states and many others, the predominant rice growing states now, they use groundwater and they're depleting it pretty fast and it's a big issue for them. But there are definitely downsides to these tidal swamps. Having been cut from the river's marshland, they're susceptible to erosion, especially with tropical storms and hurricanes. The river salinity can change um, and it's not due simply just to sea level rise. In North Carolina, the power companies built dams on the PD River and so they are holding back some of the fresh water that, and so we're getting increased salinity. Not every year, but sometimes. 
and Clemson, thankfully, is working on these heirloom rice varieties, um, trying to get them more salt tolerant. So hopefully that's going to help. These fields are muddy, impossible to work in with horses and mules, much less heavy equipment. With the advent of mechanization, the move to upland rice in the southwest made it much more economical to grow. Less flavorful but higher yielding varieties became the norm in those wet southwestern states as time went on. Today, most rice grown in the U.S. is a commodity. Yield is a top priority. Flavor, texture, culinary ability, all are secondary. Having the special terroir that these historic fields have is more work. The special heirloom varieties reduce the yields, but the result is something special, moving rice from just a filler to the mainstay of the plate. Other issues included labor. Labor certainly became more expensive after the Civil War. Those continuing to grow rice needed the labor, and the freedmen need salaries to live. Some of the former slaves moved away, but many didn't know anything else, and so they stayed on. <clears throat> Storms caused great damage to the fields, especially in the late 1890s and early 1900s. After the Civil War, landowners could barely pay their taxes, so reserves for repair work was non-existent. One other factor was the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. That made it easier for rice to be imported to Europe from the Middle East and the Far East. That caused a great decrease in demand for American rice. It was a combination of higher expenses, competition in other states where it was easier to grow the rice, the loss of much of the European market, and finally the storms raging seemingly year after year that was death knell of the South Carolina rice industry. So White House Plantation, where we grow the rice, shown here, it's the last piece of high land on the PD River. And on the right side is the Black River. So um, Charleston thinks that the Cooper goes and forms the ocean, but it's actually the PD and the Black form, form, form Winyaw Bay, and then they form the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> so you have to be far enough away from the ocean that the water's fresh, but you need the tides to irrigate with. So you have to be fairly close. White House was established in 1735 by King's grant to Daniel Crawford. Some of the owners of White House were James Crockett in the 1760 and Ralph Izzard in 1794. He left White House to his daughter, Mary Izzard Pringle, whose husband died only one year after they were married and she had a son by him shortly after his death. She later married Joel Roberts Poinsett, congressman, minister to Mexico, and secretary of war under Martin Van Buren. Poinsett was a great naturalist, and the flower Poinsett is named after him. He created beautiful gardens at White House with the help of Andrew Jackson Downing, who is known in many circles as the founder of American um, landscape architecture. He did the Smithsonian. Upon Mary Izzard Pringle Poinsett's death, White House went to Julius Pringle, her son, and he died in Rome in 1863, and White House then belonged to his son, John Julius Pringle, who married the governor, uh, daughter of Governor Robert Austin Elizabeth. Elizabeth Austin Pringle never had children, her husband, John Julius, died after a few years of marriage, and she continued on working White House and later her childhood home, Shakur Wood. Her exploit as a widow managing rice plantations after the Civil War is documented in her book, A Woman Rice Planter. She continued to grow, at White, grow rice at White House until somewhere around 1910. I'm often asked how I got into rice farming. I would say it's equal parts ignorance and enthusiasm. <laughs> we started planting rice for ducks to eat, and it grew pretty well in our muddy fields, so we decided to try an heirloom rice, Charleston Gold. It grew well, but we had issues. 
Farmers are by nature optimistic. Every year we think this is going to be a good year. It's going to all work this year. It hadn't happened yet, but someday it will. Our first problem was harvesting. Campbell Cox had tried to grow rice in our fields before we owned Wright House, and his combine got stuck, so he went looking, so, and he said never again. So we went looking for a small harvester. Should be easy, right? Well, nobody in the U.S. makes a small harvester. There are plenty made in India and Japan and China, but they're all self-contained little machines with tracks, and the motors are not EPA approved, so you couldn't import one. So, I found on a Google search a John Deere harvester, 731. Now, the Google search didn't show this standard agriculture and industries up in the corner there, just that. And that certainly looks like a John Deere, doesn't it? So, I called around and called around, and finally somebody at corporate office in John Deere said, no, we don't make that standard agricultural works, and India makes that. So, I talked to them, finally. They gave me a decent price, about $6,000, and it fits on a John Deere 5300, which we had. So it was, I said, that's great. And they said, no, we can't sell it to you. You've got to send us a tractor. We'll put it on and send it back to you. And I'm not doing that. So they were refusing to sell it to me. We had a, a meeting at the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation at the USDA in Charleston. And Merle Shepard from Clemson introduced me to Shaker Kuzik, who's a plant pathologist for the USDA. He's from India, and he suggested that he call him and try to talk him into selling it to me, which he did. It was very helpful. I won't bore you with the customs and all the stuff that happened. We finally got it here, and we had a mechanic help us put it together. And here it is, almost finished. There's some rice coming out of it. And so it works pretty good, and we have a custom shade built on it there. And are you able to make, there we go. So there it is. You can see it. This is uh, last year. Paint's kind of worn off, works real slow, but it works. The Charleston Gold grew great. Just about time for the harvest, Hurricane Florence was approaching. We were able to work one afternoon, and for a few hours we were harvested rice, and we got about 600 pounds. Next, we had to have some place to dry the rice. I had planned on using Campbell Cox's drying bins, but due to the storm, he had everything full. So, a buddy of mine from Effingham, Henry Swink, with McCall Farms, found somebody with a peanut drying wagon, dried the rice for us. Then he found somebody to clean it. Then we had to be able to process it. So Greg Johnsman at Geechee Boy Mill, now Marsh Hen Mill, agreed to mill it for us. We had some cloth bags made with our dog, Jake, gentleman Jake's rice, and Jake's still with us, he's 14 now. Um, <clears throat> and so we got these bags to Greg and he processed it and, and put it in the bags for us. We gave these to friends as present and it was absolutely the most fantastic rice I'd ever had. So there again, one of the enthusiasm kind of ticks up. Say, so go away ignorance. So next year, we're going to have a great crop. We decide to partner with Greg Johnsman. We will provide the rice and the bags, and he will mill it and sell it. Perfect. We needed the bags to be approved by the Department of Agriculture. So we had to go through the process of getting a nutrition label, proper wordings, font sizes, metrics, everything. So we also needed drying bins. There are plenty of used drying bins around the state, and we found someone to get us a couple and put them up on our fields. <clears throat> we also, the harvester from India works great, but it's slow. So we added a used harvester from Japan that it, someone had imported before the EPA issue and it was grandfathered in. There it is. 
and here it is working. And it seems to work okay, but you see those little white teeth in the front. They're plastic. They break every few minutes. Um, it jams up in the back. It was pretty much a nightmare. So the next year we sold it back to the guy we bought it from. Didn't lose too much. Um, <clears throat> we used the river for irrigation and the trunks work great moving the water in and out. But the lowest tides are not low enough to get the water down enough to really dry the fields. The quarter drains retain water in them so the fields are still boggy. So we put pumps in the ditches to take the water out. That's worked great. There's one of the pumps pumping out to the river. This is the field on the inside. And so now we can get heavier equipment in. And so here's how we get it dry enough to plant. And we plant with a grain drill. The next problem was cleaning the rice after drying. There are several places to clean grains around the state, but most of them are booked up when you need them. We used a place in St. George, Florence, and even shipped a load to Clemson. The next problem is storage. Marsh Hen Mill doesn't have enough storage for all the rice, and we don't have it at the farm either. To make sure that bugs don't grow in the rice, it can be placed in semi-cold storage, somewhere below 58 degrees. There's a warehouse in Orangeburg that has this, and so we started taking our rice there, and Marsh Hen would come get it as, as it needed. With all that worked out, we seem to be set for a while. We're good. At this point, we lost Andy. <clears throat> One of the things that we did was we rebranded the rice from Gentleman Jake to Andy's. While Marsh Hen still processed and bagged the rice for us, we took over the marketing. Any new product is difficult to grow, but the quality is so good that we, all we have to do is show it and it will sell itself. Sometimes getting a meeting to show it is very difficult with a large corporate buyer. So we still have a long way to go. Um, we just made our first shipment to New York for big Y grocery stores up there, so hopefully the Yankees will appreciate it. And of course, what really helped during all this time was COVID. It was wonderful. We had so much difficulty getting rice cleaned that we bought our own cleaner from Brazil. We still use this. So the harvester being so slow and the Japanese harvester not working out and with the pumps getting the fields dry enough, we bought a large John Deere. And you can see the, the green sections, that's, those are the uh, quarter drains. And even though the field is very dry, if you don't have the quarter drains, this mud will hold the water. So the field can be dry, but you can look in the quarter drain and it's still seeping water out. So this makes it, you know, you lose a lot of area. It's much more difficult for the things, for growing. You'll see the, the header on this harvester is different than most. Mostly you have a platform header, which was like that small one, it's just a spinning thing like that. But most crops, when you harvest them, they're fully dry seeing wheat fields and so forth. But the rice, you can't see it here, but even though the rice is brown or gold, underneath the stems are still green. In a regular platform header, every few yards, that green moisture would get clogged up in there and you'd have to stop and take things apart, and it was just a nightmare. So we got this used, um, this used header called a stripper header from Arkansas, it's what they use. And it just pulls the seeds off and leaves the stalks. So it works great. And you can see how much area the quarter drains take up. Well, there can't be any other issues, right? Well, about this time, Greg Johnsman informs us that we have too much rice and he can't handle it. So we have about nine months to find some milling equipment and do it ourselves. 
We talked to suppliers from Japan and China, prices starting to climb after COVID, especially shipping costs and delivery times. We talked with a Brazilian company that supplied our cleaner and their equipment is more automated and needs less labor, but timing for them is also a question as well as the cost. Fortunately, they knew a grower in Mississippi who had bought a mill from them and he was ready to sell it. He was a large rice grower and sold most of his stuff to the co-op. He decided he would make some on his own and his own special bag and so forth, but he was still growing commodity rice. And so there was nothing really special about it and he couldn't make much more money on it. So it didn't work for him. For us, we're selling a specialty product basically and we can, we can charge more for it. <clears throat> so we negotiated with him for quite a while, finally bought everything that he had, including a roller mill, which I didn't really want. But our rice grits have been so popular that we use the roller mill to make more. Normally the rice grits are the middlings, the broken pieces, that are the leftovers from the milling process. The broken pieces are taken out by an indented cylinder and they are kept for Midlands rice grits. But demand that we have is even higher than what the mill produces. So we run full grains through the roller mill to make extra. <clears throat> an engineer friend helped us with the layout mechanical, electrical, and getting all this stuff put back together. And after a few months, we were ready for Department of Agriculture inspection. And we received that in January of 2023. Now we're fully integrated, doing everything on site from planting, growing, harvesting, cleaning, drying, and packaging. That's a color sorter. And we do everything all the way to the end. Now, we didn't want to sit, ship the product down to Orangeburg to be stored in cold storage and then have to bring it back. So what are we going to do with that? So we found a company called Grain Pro that works in the Philippines mainly. That's where they're from. And they make these bags. You put the rice in the super sack and inside that green bag, and then you pump it full of CO2. CO2, the bugs can't live in it. So you don't have to worry about the bugs. Also, if you have the rice, rice dried properly before you put it in there, mold won't grow without oxygen and moisture. So it works great. So many rice growers mill everything all at once. They get their crop in, they mill it, put it in a bag, and they're done. But it stays fresher in the husk. So we leave it in these bags until we need it, and then we process it. Our two biggest problems are storms, and this is directly from the NOAA website, <laughs> and blackbirds are the other problem. Hurricanes can destroy all the crop, obviously, and the birds can eat up to half of the crop easily. And just watch this. So you hear 22 shooting. That's the one thing that they're scared of. You're not shooting the birds, you're shooting under them. But they go straight back down and you have to do it again, getting ready to do it again. And you just have to keep doing that and eventually they'll get tired of it and they'll circle around up, up top and then they'll leave. But they'll be back 15 minutes later. So you gotta have somebody there all day. And they're still gonna get their share of it. Um, <clears throat> we had a few of the normal things go wrong during the harvest, such as a harvester getting stuck in the mud and had to pull it out with a track hoe. Which held us up for a day of good harvest weather because we had to get the track hoe in there.
But overall, the harvest went well, and we had a nice crop. With everything in the barn, we watched as the remnants of Hurricane Ian that had devastated much of Florida, it arrived in South Carolina, came exactly over the top of our fields. Luckily, we didn't have a break in the dikes, but water flowed over top, and that water had salt in it. It killed our second crop of rice that we were growing for the ducks. And so this year, when we planted, we found out, oh, well, this, this is a second crop. This is a ratoon crop. This ratoon crop Rice grows in 120 days, and once you cut it off, it's grass like this, and it'll grow a second crop in 60 more days, and we leave that for the ducks, so it's a win-win. So this is a second crop that grew well, but last year we didn't have that because the salt killed it. Um, we thought the salt would be okay, we'd rinse the water out and everything would be fine. But we found out that it settled in the low areas of the fields. And you can see the areas that did not grow rice. So this year, most of these fields, we're not planting. We're having to flush it with fresh water, and hopefully after a year, we'll be able to use them again. So once again, like a University of South Carolina football fan, it's gonna be great next year. You just wait. Everything in hand and it'll be great. So that's all I have and I will answer any questions. Yes, Gary. No, no, they, they have a FERC license, and their license says that they have to let out as much as they bring in. So, you know, they, that's all they have to do. But what they do is they've sold a lot of lots around their lakes, and they want to keep it high, so they wait until they have too much, where it would get a lot of rains and so forth, where it would be fresh anyway, then they let it all out at once. So they're letting out the same amount they're letting in, they're taking in, but they don't care. They've got a license and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And they don't publish it in the table or whatever they're doing or anything? Yeah, they, they, will, they, they try to let people know some when, it, when it's going to happen, but it's, a lot of it's depending on the rain and so forth. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charleston gold and um, Carolina gold are more like medium grain rice. Now, we also have Santee gold rice, which is the long grain of Carolina gold. Um, the Charleston gold was developed, the, one of the issues with Carolina gold is it grows tall. And so it'll lodge easily. And lodging is when winds blow and knock the, knock the rice down. And it's difficult, if not impossible, to harvest. Also, it's a very low yielding variety and it's susceptible to many diseases. So some 20 years ago or so, Merrill Shepard from Clemson and a cohort in the Philippines work together with natural cross-pollinization um, with different rice varieties, including basmati, to make a shorter, higher yielding, and more disease resistant variety. And they did this for over about 15 years, and every year they would test it to make sure that the culinary ability was like Carolina gold and all of these things that they were looking for and just kept picking the ones that they wanted and planting those. And finally, um, Dr. Anna McClung um, helped get it finalized 
as a USDA variety, um, which is Charleston Gold. So it's an aromatic version of Carolina Gold, but it has the same shorter grain. In the 1850s, um, at Brook Green, the um, planter found one section that had some longer grains in it. He kept those out separately and did the same thing without, the, of course, a genetic knowledge and so forth, but he did the same thing, planted just these longer grains in a separate field. And then those that also produced long, he kept those and did it again. And finally, he had enough to grow whole fields of it. And this they called long gold. And the long gold won two international competitions for rice in the 1850s. But that was close to the war, and it was pretty much lost to history. So again, some 10, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, I think it was, um, they asked Dr. Anna McClung to try to recreate this. And so she did the same thing with Carolina Gold and an extra long grain variety. And again, tried to maintain the culinary ability and the mouthfeel and so forth of Carolina Gold. And year before last, it was finally approved, and that's Santee Gold. So you have Charleston Gold, which is the aromatic variety of Carolina Gold, and the long grain variety is the Santee Gold. Um, three questions. Okay. What birds eat your crop? Red winged blackbirds mostly. Okay. Who makes your rice crop? Um, Bill Mace, mm -hmm. and down at Annandale, yeah. Okay. And are you able to buy crop insurance? Not yet. Been trying. Is it not available for, for rice? I mean, I know it, it is, but you've got to have so many years of records and so forth, and we're, we're working on it. Um, we, so red-winged blackbirds mostly. Used to be the rice birds, the bobolink. Um, and we found out last year there's still a bunch of them around because we planted a little bit later, and they migrate in September, and we had great flocks of them while we were trying to harvest. But the red-winged blackbirds are here all the time. They're supposed to be migratory, but they're not leaving as long as they're food to eat. Yes, Susan. Don, what, what you've done is awesome, but I'm wondering, are there any students coming up following what you're doing to carry it on? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the. Um, Working with the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation, um, Clemson's doing that, and they're, they've got students that are working on it and trying to help rebuild some rice growing in the state. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah. No, I, I couldn't hear that. I'm sorry. Do you know what species it is that are being grown in West Africa? Is it diverse or would it be a totally different species lifespan? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what species they were growing back then, and I'm not sure what varieties they're growing now.
Thank you. Yes, sir. I want to know a little bit more about the plant. Is it just one stalk and then one, gra one grain with a covering on it? Or how no, no. What you, it's one seed, but then it has different tillers on it. And so, let's see. There you go. Um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, Santee Gold. That's one stalk. Yeah, but more than one stalk will come out of the bottom of that one seed. So you'll get several tillers out of that. Yeah, it's, it's um, you could compare it to a nut. So the, what happens is the, the, you get the, you'll get the hull first, and then on the inside, this little white stuff gets in there and it starts milking. So it's, it's what you call milking the rice and it's, it's liquid. It's, white, it's a white liquid that's inside the hull and that's when the birds start go crazy over it. And then that milk turns into dough and then it turns hard and that's your rice. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yes, ma'am. This is a planter in Arkansas and California that will look in and do seeds and birds out there too. Well, the difference is there's so many hundreds of thousands of acres growing that the birds are dispersed, and we're the only grower in the, in the county, except maybe Craig back there is growing a little bit, but it's, it, you know, they all just flock to us. So that's, that's the problem. What's your yield per acre? The, these varieties will produce about 6,000 pounds per acre, but we're lucky to get half of that with the birds and so forth. Would you do it again? I'm right in, I'm in the deep end. <laughs> I, I can't get out. Sides are too high. Um, and we have some rice over there to sell even. So if anybody would like some. But any other questions? The I couldn't follow that. Oh yeah, it is. I mean, you can see the field down in the background is kind of fuzzy, but it, it, it really is a gold color and it, it's beautiful. These, um, these varieties are wonderful. And you can smell the rice when you're growing it. It's absolutely fantastic. Do you sell your seeds at um, all? Some, we have. Thank you. Don, thank you. Thank you very, very much. You can go out this door, so you go right past the rice, so you can buy some. And how much are they, Don? Ten dollars back. Oh. And we have more samples, so if anyone likes yes. rice. Yes. Taylor's made some more rice for us. Wow, what an amazing, amazing presentation. What amazing work. If he asked me if I want to do it, no thank you. I don't think there's competitors. Is, is there, there is somebody else here who's raising? No, well, Craig works with Fish and Wildlife and oh. they, they grow some not in harvest, but. Uh, wow. Wow. And, and Hannah, do you have some at, uh, Hampton, you don't have any at Hampton. Okay. Very good. And hop call.
and does a tour once a year. Very good. Well, Don, thank you. This was just incredible. What an incredible story. Wow. You hear these stories of historical figures that went through all these struggles and difficulties and at the end came out and this is just one of those as well. An amazing story locally for us here in Georgetown. So I want to thank Don and uh, for his sharing with us. And also, as I mentioned, this being the last lecture of our series for this year, we've been homeless since uh, last spring uh, with the library's construction going on. And we have really appreciated Dedrick Bonds and the Winnie Auditorium Association for allowing us to find a home here through our series this year, beginning last September and going up through today. So I express appreciation uh, to uh, Winnie Auditorium Association, just good people, and Dedrick Bonds' assistance to us, and today, also Gary's assistance with some of the technology issues. Want to mention to you as well that our series for next year has been finalized uh, as you came in or as you go out. You can pick up a schedule for next year. It is always on the third Tuesday and we will be back at the auditorium of the, the new auditorium of our renovated library uh, starting in September. It's always the third Tuesday at 10 o'clock, Tuesdays with. We are really, if I, if I may brag on our schedule for next year, including a couple that very specifically relate to the topic of today, uh, next January, Jody Barnes is going to be coming back for a second year. She was here previous in this year, archaeologist out on South Island, and she was doing some work there with uh, African-American uh, fishing villages, uh, a fishing village that was out there, and she was talking about the uh, skeletal remains that they had found and the background and history related to that. And as she finished up, she also mentioned that uh, she had been doing some work on their trash pits in which they found what was the diet, the food remnants of uh, what was out there. So she's going to be coming back on January 14th, the archaeology of food on South Island, and find out what Gullah food really is uh, back in the year 1900. So that should be an interesting presentation. In the following month, Kendi Altizer, assistant professor of anthropology at North Georgia University, is coming. She's been doing archaeological work on uh, the area of South Santee, specifically to slave life, enslaved African life in the plantations. And her presentation is going to be the most, inhos the most inhospitable of environments in slave life in the rice fields on the Santee Delta. So I'm sure you'll find that interesting as well. I should mention Hannah is on our schedule for next year. She'll speak. Uh, she is the um, bark interpreter at Hampton Plantation. And just a really good schedule all the way from the beginning with Dwight McInvale, our library director, as we celebrate this year, the 225th anniversary of the Georgetown Library, going all the way through at the end of the year, Ed Piotrowski coming to speak, a uh, bit biographic, autobiographical on his father who was a Second World War veteran. And he's gonna be speaking on that in May. The whole schedule is really good, if I may say so. Wow, I, I'm impressed. Anyway, hope you'll come and join us next year for that schedule as we have it out now. I also want to mention a couple other things. Uh, library update. Everybody asked me when. Uh, late June, July. We put books up on the shelves last week. Uh, we were able to do that. What was supposed to take two and a half to three weeks, we did in four days. <laughs> Yay, volunteers for the Friends of the Library. Thank you for several of you who are involved in that. Our Farmer's Market book sales. Uh, resume on June 1st. Uh, here's our expert buyer. Uh, on June 1st, we begin every Saturday. We'll be at the Georgetown Farmers Market selling books. Those uh, proceeds go toward the children's reading programs at the library. And the friends have been involved with the library um, expansion and renovation in a number of different ways. We had a very successful and just a wonderful experience in landscaping the property around the new auditorium if you go by I think it looks really good and a great group of volunteers from the Friends put all that together as well as many of you and your donations. But there's a second project we're currently working on uh, that will be completed in 2025 and that is a statue that we're going to be putting just at the entrance to the new children's reading area uh, called right here, Whispers of My Ancestors. A ancestor, excuse me, Whispers of My Ancestor. And that's a statue that will portray uh, Harriet Tubman uh, with her grandnephew, James Boley, who was from here in Georgetown. And it's going to be a touch uh, statue, so the kids, as they come in, can touch it. And it's going to be actually about that size and about that height uh, that you see right there. 
And we're looking for continued donations toward the making of that. It's done. Um, Wesley Wofford, who is an outstanding sculptor, uh, is going to be doing that for us. He was the same one who did the Harriet Tubman statue that was here in Georgetown last fall. And if you'd like to contribute to that, we'd be very glad to accept your donations toward that. We have it, we're at 70% right now, which is just, to me, amazing of what has been the generosity of the Georgetown community. That's about a $40,000 uh, donation process that we're going through. I thank you all again for being here today. I thank you for your patience as we began and wish you a wonderful summer and look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you all. And Don, again, thank you. Don't forget the rice.